the Cold War and communism were a way to maintain and enhance the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower had warned in 1959. In effect, there was a sort of a sense of uncertainty and loss when the Soviet Union fell rather than celebratory because the, the establishment did not quite know how to bring back an enemy justify the enormous expenditures of the military. I once calculated that the cost of the Cold War was $25 trillion of military expenditures. If you ask what the meaning of such an astronomic sum is resolving all the problems, not only in the United States, but hunger, malaria, tuberculosis, clean water, you name an issue. And that would have been well resolved within the parameters of these mad expenditures. So it's not the fact that we don't have a dividend largely relates to your and my failure in not being imaginatively activist, in not continuing the struggle, in thinking we have victory, and like most intellectuals that you and I are, <laughs> you accept being accused of being an intellectual. <laughs> but uh, that, in fact, we, we, we take a weekend. They never take a weekend off. And the tragedy is that today the world is facing potentially catastrophic problems. Foremost in my mind is the North-South divide. And if you read my book, as you did, you know I allude to that as being the, the motor of the Cold War. In my mind, the Cold War was, had little to do with communism. It had to do mostly with the North-South divide. And, uh, and we should discuss that, if you wish. Well, in fact, I, I'm using that uh, argument in my talk tomorrow morning. Uh, the neocolonialist expansion of Soviet interests in the Third World and as a threat to North American interests. Well, but, but it's extraordinarily deep, and I don't think we, meaning the progressive intellectuals have not really grasped at the roots of this particular problem. Because in effect, we are still living in the age of Christopher Columbus. We're in the Columbus age, the Columbine age. No, Columbine is a bad word in America. Uh, Columbian age, or whatever. Because Christopher Columbus established a new precept of profound implications that you can become rich without tortured labor by appropriating the wealth of others. Sometimes it involved genocide. Sometimes it involved robbery, acquisition, expropriation, ethnic cleansing. And this is what, in fact, we are still practicing today. And because we are what is so fascinating to me is that when you look at left-wing movements in the world, between World War I and World War II, the Communist Party of France, of Holland, of Belgium, of Britain, were never really anti-colonial. And in part because the standard of living in America is much higher because we have colonized the rest of the world, including Canada and uh, through NAFTA, Mexico, and whatnot. And because we have, there's a quiet. We have been bribed. You and I have been bribed in an enormous way. So this is an issue off the table. Nobody talks about it. We are ready to give charity to Haiti, but not ask the question, why does Haiti need charity? Right. Mahatma Gandhi said, 
We have enough to satisfy human need, but not human greed. Well, it's, it's the moment we put it in such terms, we reduce it to a psychological problem. And I There's object. There's a here, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's <laughs> mac macro parasitism. Whatever, whatever name you give it, in fact, the reality is that we have appropriated enormous wealth that made the Industrial Revolution possible, made the high standard of living we have and others have. When you travel in Africa today, you're immediately impressed with the enormous wealth of that continent, probably the wealthiest continent of any. You had the abysmal poverty, the abysmal, and that doesn't relate to the fact that they are inferior, that, you know, a white person would ascribe to them. That's part of our subconscious, really, reality. Uh, profound racism that has gone along with the ability to enable uh, taking from Africa so much wealth over so many centuries. So we have a difficult problem. But the, the fascinating, to go back, I would rather talk about the IPPNW ex experience because to me this is a remarkable happening. Uh, and that is, you know, in I, I, I went to a meeting in 1960 to hear a Britisher uh, who, Philip Noel Baker, who had just won the Nobel Prize, the year would have been 1960. And I, at the time, was heavily involved in cardiovascular research on sudden cardiac death. And there was no research going on on the subject anywhere. That's astonishing. Because at that time, there was one person dying every 80 seconds in the United States. And do you know how much money was being appropriated for research on sudden cardiac death in the United States? $10 per businessman who dropped in. And I was sort of, during the Vietnam War, when I spoke in public, I said, the United States is ready to, is, is unable to spend more than $10 on a, to save the life of a businessman, yet is ready to spend $150,000 to kill a Vietnamese peasant. You know, the, the, the point, I was involved with sudden cardiac death, and now this Britisher, talks about the fact that none of us will be around by the year 2000, a mere 40 years away. Because he made a deep analysis of the nuclear arms race then beginning, and he predicted that. And I, I, I left the meeting totally stunned. Here I had a fam young family, three little kids. I'm at the height of my medical career. I have just invented defibrillator, cardioverter, started coronary care, launched a whole array of ways of monitoring arrhythmia and a scientific approach to dealing with arrhythmias and began to introduce the fact that psychologic factors are profound hidden risk factor for coronary artery disease, a subject yet not fully pursued. So I was doing well and I couldn't get any money for sudden cardiac death. I couldn't. And so I then had a bizarre idea and my idea was uh, was in effect to get the Russians involved with sudden cardiac death and if they got involved with that the institute would unleash enormous amounts of money <laughs> uh, this was sort of a Talmudic exegesis you know <laughs> Because, but I didn't know a single Russian. And, uh, and, uh, what is to be done? Uh, so I had to meet a Russian. I had to meet a Russian. And, uh, and, uh, and that was, remember, that was the time of Sputnik. 